Hi, and welcome back to the Maintenance Factory. In this episode, we're going to talk about the basic principle of operation for a motor contactor. So stick around. So welcome back to the channel. As mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about the basic principle of operation for a contactor and uh, not the whole entire starter itself, but just the contactor uh, and that only. And what we're going to talk about is how this thing works, uh, what they look like, or at least a couple of examples of what they look like. And then later on in the video, we're going to take one apart on the bench and let you get a good idea of what the parts and pieces look like uh, on the inside of one of these. Um, if you haven't already, I ask that you subscribe to the channel, uh, click the thumbs up or maybe the thumbs down even. And then click that notification bell and you'll be alerted the next time we put out a video. So let's get to it. So if you remember in a previous video, we had talked about the basic principle of operation for a motor control circuit. And on that motor control circuit, you may remember looking at a component that looked like this. And then now this component was the uh, contactor for the motor starter circuit. And it had an overload connected to it. And we had a motor, and I believe in the drawing we had these labeled as L1, L2, and L3. The motor was labeled M1. And to describe what we're looking at here, you have basically three components. You have a contactor, which is this portion. You have an overload circuit, and then you have the motor itself. And today's video we're just going to focus on this portion of the drawing and the physical uh, part that makes this guy up. So in the video uh, L1, L2, and L3 was connected to um, 480 volts AC uh, sinusoidal waveform and this is a pretty common uh, motor starter configuration. Of course this right here omits the uh, control portion of this which would start and stop basically open and close these contacts but if you missed all that or if you have questions about that go back to the previous video and watch it and it explains how the whole entire uh, piece works together so I've got a couple examples I'll get this out of the way here so one example is a uh, Allen Bradley C60 this is a hundred amp contactor um, there's no overload here. This is just strictly the contactor itself. Now, this contactor has got a uh, 120 volts AC coil, and the connection points are on the top. And I'm going to face that toward you. So here are the two terminals for the coil voltage. And then, looking back at the face of the unit, you have the line side connections on the top. So these three terminals here, and then you have the load side connections on the bottom. But these three terminals here. This model has also got an auxiliary contactor mounted on the side. Now this unit is capable of uh, handling a hundred amps of current and uh, it's pretty good sized contactor. Uh, nowhere close to being the biggest but not real small either. Pretty common. Now another contactor here that's probably more common is a, again another Allen Bradley. It's a 100-C16 contactor. Now this right here is what someone may refer to as a motor starter which would include the overload. So this right here is actually two physical components. Uh, the contactor portion which is this upper unit and then the lower unit is the overload itself. And remember in the video we're not going to talk about the overload we're just going to strictly focus on the contactor. And this is the one that I'm going to take apart later on in the video to show you uh, the internals of it. So let's draw a little bit on the board before we do that. That explains a little more about how the thing works. This marker will probably squeak. No, got lucky. Okay. So the internal workings of this contactor, there's going to be a lower iron core that looks like the shape of an E. And that lower iron core is what houses the coal where you would connect your 110 or 120 volt um, control voltage and you have this coal that's wrapped around the center of this iron 
uh, core. And then on the contactor itself, this is labeled A1 and A2. Now this A1 and A2 is not related to anything that was drawn on the uh, uh, motor starter circuit in the previous video. This is just something that you'll actually find um, written on the top of the contactor at the terminals. So, like explained earlier, both of these operate on 120 volts, and that's alternating current, sinusoidal waveform. And <clears throat> whenever you apply 120 volts across these two terminals, and then current passes through the wire, there's an electromagnetic field generated in this iron core. Just directly above this is another E-shaped component. that I refer to as the armature. Armature. And down here we can call this the coil or you may call it the core. It's actually both. And as uh, current is applied to this coil, this core becomes energized with an electromagnetic field and it wants to attract the armature. As it attracts the armature, the armature moves down, and then what it does is it closes this gap. There will be no gap between the two, uh, maybe just a little bit, so that when the magnetic field collapses, there's a spring in here that will push the armature back up. And that as it opens it back up, it uh, also opens up the contacts in the contactor. So if you can imagine, on uh, the top of this armature is attached a component that holds a set of contacts. And these two little rectangular or square shaped blocks represent two points of contact and this bar also represents a conductor. Just below that in a stationary portion of the contactor lies another set of contacts. This side in this example we'll say this is connected to the line voltage which would be the 480 volts three phase that we talked about earlier. Now this does not represent three phases of connection points. Rather, this just represents one set of contacts for what would be in a three phase motor control circuit. And then on this side, you would connect to the load or the overload in this case that was drawn earlier. Now you can imagine that this bar here and this conductor is attached to the armature. So as this armature is uh, actuated and moves up and down, this uh, conductor bar with contacts moves up and down with it. This, this component and this component are stationary. They do not move. They are basically mounted to the housing or the frame of the contactor. So as 120 volts AC is applied to the coil, the electromagnetic field is generated. It attracts the armature. And then once the armature is attracted to the core, it pulls this contact down, closing the gap here. And then once that gap is closed, now you've created a path for current to flow from the line side to the load side. Now, also when we uh, take apart this contactor, I want to call out some uh, pretty common failure modes that exist. Now, one, con or one failure mode that I'm probably not going to talk about is actual loose uh, connection points or loose terminations. It's not necessarily a failure of the contactor itself, but it's just a failure of the design of the, the components when they were installed. Uh, because right here you would have a terminal block with a screw, and you'd have another terminal block here with a screw, where you would actually insert a wire, and if this screw is not fastened properly to the right torque specification, then you'll have a loose terminal. Um, and then that loose terminal is going to generate heat and that's going to increase your resistance and then you're going to have other problems. So I, I try to outline all of the failure modes except for that particular one, but it's worth mentioning and uh, worth talking about. So let's go over to the bench and we'll take apart this Allen Bradley contactor and get a better idea of what's inside of it. So here we are at the bench and we're going to take apart this contactor and take a look at the internal workings. So if you recall from earlier, I said that this is actually two separate components. So this section here is considered the contactor, and this portion here is considered the overload. 
So what we want to do is just go ahead and remove this overload. And it's pretty simple. Uh, there's three conductors that are underneath uh, three of these terminals that are on the load side of the contactor. You loosen them up a bit. And then down at the base of the contactor itself, there's a little tab. And you pull up on it just a little. Yeah, get a smaller screwdriver here. There we go. And then you just kind of pick up and slide out. And the two come apart. It's pretty simple. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I guess the first thing we want to do is just talk a little bit about the uh, physical layout of the contactor itself so as mentioned earlier in the video we talked about these two connection points uh, that energize the coil which again it moves the armature uh, so what that does it will put the open contacts into the closed position so if you look here on the coil there's the uh, A1 and the A2 that I talked about which does not reflect the uh, diagram that was drawn on the previous video uh, also, there's a voltage call out here, 120 volts, 60 hertz, and then there's 110 volts at 50 hertz. So having the hertz or the frequency call out uh, keys me up to know that it's a, a sinusoidal waveform, so AC voltage. So uh, <clears throat> if you'll notice here that there's uh, three sets of contacts uh, on the load sides labeled L1, L2, and L3. And then on the load side is labeled T1, T2, and T3. And all three of these contacts are, are normally open on a contactor. And there's a fourth uh, contact over here. And in the previous video, when I made mention of a auxiliary contact, this is the one that I was referring to. So this auxiliary contact uh, opens and closes or changes states with the three contacts. Uh, for the motor portion of it. So here you can see it's got an NO, which designates that it's a normally open contact. And it's got a considerably smaller surface area on the uh, contact itself, and we'll get to that here in a second. Uh, the other thing I may point out is some of these will have an auxiliary contact mounted on either side. It could be on the left side, it could have been on the right side, it could be on both. Um, and what happens is it just kind of snaps onto the side of the housing and then if you'll watch this portion here it moves in sync with the armature and it does that on both sides so you could have an auxiliary contact uh, added to the side of this thing uh, it could have a couple of contacts one normally open one normally close or just a normally open or just a normally close just about any configuration you like now on the front of this you could also attach another set of auxiliary contacts that would just kind of snap down on the front of it and would engage this uh, armature piece. Now this right here also serves at a, as a manual button to manually actuate the contactor. And I, I don't really recommend that you do that in a real world situation, uh, no matter what the circumstance, because you're at risk of injuring yourself or maybe someone that's working with you. So let's go ahead and get started by taking off the, the front cover here and we'll just kind of pop it loose. All right, and we'll set it to the side. There's nothing really interesting about it. There's two more um, covers on the top and the bottom here and we'll get rid of those and set them aside. Now at this point we have exposed the uh, terminations or the terminal points for the contacts themselves and uh, it's not really easy to see in there uh, but you can see a brass looking contact right here I'm lifting it up with the tip of my screwdriver it moves in conjunction with this plastic button here or the armature and that is actually what houses a contact with a conductor bar that allows current to pass from the uh, line side to the load side. So let's go ahead and continue to take this thing apart. Uh, there's a retention spring here and we'll pick up on the body. There we go. There's another retention spring on this side. Now you'll notice 
as I lift on it, uh, lift this off, the armature uh, falls down. And below the armature is a spring. And the spring is what's pushing the armature along with the contacts up to keep them in the open position. All right, so if you remember on the drawing earlier, uh, I had drawn an E-shaped um, laminated core section, and here is the actual armature, the core is still in the base of the unit. But you can tell it's nothing more than some steel laminates. They've probably went through a heat treating process or a chemical process, and uh, they've been stamped out on a press, and they've got these rivets that hold them together underneath a, a certain amount of pressure. So there's not any gaps or spaces between them. So we'll set this off to the side for now and we'll get back to it. So here is the base of the contactor and it houses the uh, coil which generates the electromagnetic field. So once again, this is the piece that's got the two terminals on it uh, where you would connect your 120 volts on this model, which is your uh, coal voltage, 120 volts AC. And then there's some what we call magnet wire. It's a coil of um, insulated copper windings that's uh, put on a jig and wound around and around and around. I don't know how many turns this one is. But in any event, uh, whenever that coil is energized and it's setting down inside this lower iron core, which is similar to the armature, again, you can tell that it's uh, made up of a bunch of laminated uh, metal plates and it's riveted together also. And whenever the coal is inside of that, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever the coal is inside of that iron core and current is passed through the coal, it generates an electromagnetic field. And then when that electromagnetic field is um, generated, it pulls on this upper armature and pulls it down close in contact with that until there's zero gap between the face of this and the face of that down there. You can tell there are some witness marks here where this uh, bar that's uh, across this iron core, I think that may be a shunt bar, but I'm not sure. In any event, uh, you can see where that has been contacting this uh, upper armature piece. So it takes out all the clearance between these two pieces whenever it's energized. So we'll set the uh, coil and the lower core piece, we'll set it to the side for just a second. And we'll get back to, I guess, more of the meat and potatoes of this contactor here. So in order to look at and view each of these contacts, we need to first remove all of the screws and I'll go ahead and speed up the video footage. Okay, so now we have all of the screws removed. Now the bronze looking piece or brass looking piece that you see in there is the electrical conductors for the line side and the load side. And what we want to do is remove those and then this center armature piece along with the upper contacts will fall out. So this has been taken apart before. So these actually come out pretty easily, but all you have to do is just pull on them basically and they slide right out. Before I go any further, I want to make a pretty important note here. These first three that I pulled out have a pretty large uh, surface area or contact area that passes the electrical current between the two contacts. So you can tell this one has got some pitting and it's got some carbon buildup around the edge. This unit has been in service before. And this right here is the uh, auxiliary, what I call the auxiliary contact, the normally open contact that is for circuit control. And if you look at these two side by side, if the camera will refocus, If you look at these two side by side, you can tell the one on your left of your screen has got a larger surface area than the one on the right. And that basically equates to more current carrying capability. So it's important to pay attention when you hook one of these things up and make sure that you're on the line and the load connections and not the auxiliary contact connections because the auxiliary contacts are just not designed to carry a lot of current. 
So we'll go ahead and pull these out. Now that, now that all of these are out of the way, I should be able to just lift this upper assembly off. And it's just a plastic housing. You can tell that there's some carbon buildup on some of the edges of this thing from where it's been in service. And the contacts will arc whenever it is energized and closed and whenever it goes back to the open position. So we'll set that off to the side. Now, this is what I've been referring to as the armature. Uh, more importantly, just this metal core piece is what I would consider the armature. Attached to the armature is a plastic body that holds these upper contacts. And these are what, uh, these components pass the current from the line side to the load side whenever the contactor is energized. So we'll pull one or two of these out. And all we need to do is just remove the spring. And then turn these sideways and pull them out. Okay. So this here is the same thing as, as what I showed earlier in terms of size. So this guy here is a load carrying, high current carrying contact. And now it's pitted and worn and has some carbon buildup. And then here's another contact that is not pitted or worn, uh, but it is not designed to carry a lot of current. So I just want you to have a look at that just to know that inside this contactor, there are different size contacts to carry different amounts of current. Okay, so let's talk about some of the failure modes that may exist uh, within one of these contactors. And I want to put the base and the coal back in focus here. So one of the failure mechanisms that I've seen in the past, and this may be specific to these uh, type of Allen Bradley contactors, but <clears throat> this uh, coal here, as it sets down in here, there's a certain amount of clearance that is needed between the iron core laminates and the uh, inner surface of the coil itself. Now on the bottom section, it's not so important as much as it is on the top. Because remember, this armature moves in and out of this coil. And there's quite a bit of clearance here. But if you'll notice, this coil body or assembly is made out of plastic. And if there is, a, a, for whatever reason or another, if the upper armature does not completely seat and close down on the core whenever it is energized, this coal can begin to produce uh, heat and quite a bit of heat. And if that heat gets to the point where it starts to melt the plastic, then you could have a couple of different scenarios occur, one of which is this upper stator uh, could be fused in the plastic more or less and whenever that happens <clears throat> Excuse me You could have the coil voltage uh, drop away and The spring is not strong enough to actually open the contacts up because what's happening is This portion of the iron core is embedded in the plastic of the coal Because the coal has gotten hot and it's melted the plastic. That's one scenario the other scenario is the spring has got enough force to actually move it up, but as this thing suddenly moves down, it gets hung on the plastic uh, inner portion of the coil and doesn't completely close all the way. So that's one particular failure mode that I've witnessed, although it's rare, uh, it can happen. So let's talk about a couple of other scenarios, uh, one of which is the actual contacts themselves. And it's a more common failure mode. Um, and the reason why this one was pulled out of service is because the contacts themselves, these guys, these contacts, in relation to uh, the contacts here on the armature, if you can uh, envision these things being in the open position like this, and then whenever the coal is energized, this pulls down and closes the circuit and there's now continuity between the line side and the load side. Well, from years of service, arcing, and carbon buildup, if 
If the coil voltage was to drop away and these contacts were to weld shut, then the spring tension is not great enough to push the uh, contacts in the open position. So what can happen is these contacts can stick in the closed position and the motor that you're servicing will continue to run uh, even though it's not given a run command. So that can be a dangerous uh, scenario and in the case of this was not necessarily a dangerous scenario but we were uh, pumping a uh, waste pit out and <clears throat> This contactor failed to open and the pump uh, pumped the pit completely dry until it cavitated the pump and overheated the pump. And we had quite a few other problems after that. And then once, once this was corrected and the pit was full of water again, now the pump had lost prime and we were unable to get the, the pit pump down for several hours. So anyway, uh, that's a more prominent failure mode where the contacts can become welded together and you can have a motor continue to run or maybe a motor may just single phase and and uh, burn itself up that's potentially uh, a case too the more likely scenario is going to result in some performance issues and uh, possible downtime of equipment so as these contacts again we'll just show you another example of it as these contacts um, get many cycles on them under load, they begin to arc and pit and have car carbon buildup. And then as that occurs, uh, the resistance can change between the line side and the load side of the contacts when it's in the closed position. So as this resistance uh, increases, you have more voltage drop across the contacts. And in that scenario, we'll, we'll then begin to ge generate and build up a lot of heat within the contactor and then possibly you have motor performance issues where motor uh, is not going to run or can't run uh, could could cause some other issues but in any event that's uh, probably the most common failure modes that i have witnessed with these i'm sure there's been many more um, if you have some that you want to share just leave a comment down below if there's anything i missed feel free to ask me a, a question or uh, leave a comment below. If you got some value out of the video, I ask you to subscribe, uh, hit the like button, and select that notification bell, and you'll be prompted the next time we put a video out. Thanks for watching.